Oh, Erica said, wow, I've missed so many meetings. Yes, we're on chapter 10 now. We're <laughs> halfway through the book, right? Yeah. Is 22, 31. Mm -hmm. Okay, not halfway, but still a good way. Okay, so now we're going to go into chapter 10. Chapter 10 is about planning and evaluating applied behavior analysis research. Um, and this one's going to go into section D of the task list, uh, foundations and experimental design. So we're still talking about experimental design. Okay. Erica said, I'm off for two weeks for Christmas. I'll catch up. Okay, yes. Maybe we can take, we can take like a Christmas break and that way you guys don't have to join during the holidays. Okay, so D1, distinguishing between dependent and independent variables. So knowing the difference between the two. Distinguish between internal and external validity. What page are we on? We are on 216, chapter 10. Okay, thank you. Um, D3, identifying the defining features of single subject experimental design um measure the advantages of single subject design compared to group design um, using single subject experimental design such as reversal multiple baseline multi-element and changing criteria describing rationales for conducting comparative component and parametric analysis and then it'll go into h which is selecting and implementing interventions Monitoring clients' pro progress and treatment integrity. Whew. So basically, all of this, all of the analytic part of your job as a BCBA. So being able to analyze and interpret the data and explain it um, so that people understand what your intervention is doing or how it's affecting the behavior. Um, so importance of individual subject in behavior analysis research. Okay, does anybody want to try and tell us um, what single subject or individual subject research looks like versus group? So single subject is um, individualized, whereas group is more what they do in like um, other fields where they do group uh, like psychology, like more mentalism and stuff. Yeah. Is that? So for us, the single subject is serving as its own control uh, group. Um, okay. Behavior analysis, a science devoted to discovering and understanding the controlling variables of behavior, defines its subject matter as the activity of living organisms, a dynamic phenomenon that occurs at the, at the level of the individual organism. It follows that behavior analysis research methods feature direct and repeated measures of the behavior of individual organisms. Uh, only place the definition where behavior takes place. And so we're going to focus on the behavior of individual subjects um, versus group, uh, group behavior. Brief outline of between group experiment. So who wants to go try to explain what between group experiment is? So um, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so between group is uh, you have a group of people who are considered to be a control group mm -hmm. where um, 
you don't make any changes. And the other group is the one that you apply the treatment in. So between subject is a group design where you have, you do not use the single person as a own control. You use a group as a control group and the other group where you apply the uh, intervention and that's how you you find out with the statistics you use the statistics to find out uh which group is uh, you know like um giving us the the data like um what's the data comes out as a group and and you do ch check it with the statistically am i am i right some yeah. somewhat yes perfect um, so your subjects are going to be divided into two groups. One is your experimental group and one is your control group. And so here in Cooper 217, it gives us a brief outline of between group experiment. Um, so I really like this little um, step because it kind of helps me to visualize in my head. So um, it's going to have a pool of subjects selected randomly from the population. Um, relevant to the research question. So in this example, first grade non-readers in a school district, relevant to the research will the blank XYZ intensive phonics program improve the first grade non-readers ability to decode unpredictable text. Um, so like we said, the subjects are gonna be divided into two groups, your experimental and your control. Um, initial measure pretest of the dependent variable is obtained for all subjects in the study. The individual pretest scores for the subject in each group are combined, and the mean and standard deviation are calculated for each group's performance on the pretest. So they're calculating the scores of all of those different people in each group to get their um, number. Uh, subjects in experimental group are then exposed to the independent variable. So the experimental group is going to be the only one that is going to have the intervention. And then the other group is going to be, uh, it won't be provided with the intervention. And then on number five, after the treatment program has been completed, a post-test measure of the dependent variable is obtained for all subjects. And the mean and standard deviation um, post-test scores for each group are comp computed. Uh, so that's where they're going to take the scores from the group that we applied our intervention and then the scores of the behavior for the people that didn't um, take that phonics program. So the first graders that did not participate in the phonics program, what are their grades after we uh, um, applied our intervention, I guess. Um, the researcher compares any changes in each group's scores from pre-test to post-test, applying various statistical tests to the data that enable inferences regarding the likelihood that any differences between the two groups can be attributed to the independent variable. So basically, like we said, that's the more statistical analysis where we're taking two groups of people and we're measuring the behavior and our intervention based off of um, a mean or a standard deviation versus in ABA, what we use um, our single case is going to be the individual serves as his own control group. Okay, and then group data may not represent the performance of individual subjects. So remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about um, that quote where it was like, it, it was somewhere in the book where it said, um, groups of people don't behave, individual people do or something like that. Um, so that's pretty much what they're telling us here again. So it's hard for us to determine um, if our intervention had an effect on little Susie, if we're taking a mean of all of these other people, Susie, Amy, Erica, um, so we don't even know if our intervention affected 
little Susie's behavior. It could have been a whole bunch of other different factors that we didn't take into consideration because we were observing everybody in a like broad um, view, I guess. Um, your group data may uh, mask variability. So a second problem associated with mean performance of a group of subjects is that it hides variability in the data. So that's another um, downfall to the group design is that it is going to mask variability in data. Data, uh, group data do not represent real behavioral processes. Um, okay, so who wants to explain a little bit about what they mean by group data do not represent real behavioral processes? Let's see if they gave us a little summary in the back. Does that have to do with um, when it's a group, it's more of a cultural thing, whereas with individual in the single <coughs> set, the, um, it won't be behavioral. Yeah, with that, what was that saying? The, the one saying you just said that was individual. Oh, and in, in groups of people do not behave, individual people do, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like that saying was pretty, pretty good if it is able to be engraved, ingrained in all of our heads. That will definitely help us or help you guys with the exam because there are going to be a lot of questions um, at, that might ask you why is this important or why do we um, why do we use single case studies versus um, between? Yeah. Okay, a great strength of within subject experimental design is the convincing demonstration of a functional relation made possible by replication within the design itself. So it's telling us that a um, advantage of within subject is um, that it is convincing demonstration of functional relation. So they, that's, um, that's kind of like their argument against us is that theirs is a more sound experiment um, and they're demonstrating a more functional relation uh, versus us comparing against one person. The overall performance of a group is socially significant in many situations. Um, so they are observing completely different um, things and sometimes um, the way that they use the within subject is more appropriate, like for statistical analysis, because of course I want to know what its effect is on the general population. Um, so one statistical analysis that I always think about in my head, um, I want to know how many people actually get um, married or find the love of their life on like Tinder or those dating apps, I always wonder. So that would be a good statistical analysis where you might want to use something like a within subject uh, design. You're going to uh, take the data of all of the people and see who ended up married or who was just a one night stand or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so that would be a good socially significant reason to use it within subject design. Um, when group results do not represent individual performances, researchers should implement group data within, with individual results. When the behavior analyst cannot control access to the experimental setting or identify individual subjects, the dependent variable must 
consist of the response made by individuals who enter the experimental setting. Okay, um, so that was all about the between group experiments. So then they go on to talk about the importance of flexibility in experimental design. Importance of flexibility in experimental design. Okay. Let's read this one. Um, on one level, an effective experimental design is any sequence of independent variable manipulations that produces data that are interesting and convincing to the researcher and the audience. In this context, design is appropriate as a verb as well as a noun. The effective behavioral researcher must actively design each experiment so that each achieves its own unique design. It's like a design inception, a design within a design. Okay, experimental design combining analytic tactics. So this is where it's gonna start to teach us about the different um, ways to, I guess, analyze data. So it goes into talking about component analysis. And this is going to be one of those important ABA um, terms that you know. So component analysis is any experiment designed to identify the active elements of treatment package the relative contributions of different components in a treatment package and or the necessity and sufficiency of treatment components. The effectiveness of a treatment package requires the presence of all necessary components. A sufficient component or subset of components ensure treatment effectiveness in the absence of other components. Okay, that was a lot of Cooper talk about component analysis who can explain in their own words um, what a component analysis is. I can try that. It, it's just basically um, deciding what intervention you're going to use. Um, so um, you may have DRA, you may have um, FCT, for example, just, and you're gonna just basically see, compare them to see which one works. Yes. Perfect. So it's like all of the different parts of the, um, intervention, I guess. So let's say, um, let's say you have a client who engages in disrobing. And so you're like, oh my gosh, this is a severe behavior. This is pretty serious. I need to intervene on it quickly because I don't want him disrobing in, at school or, or um, to get arrested for being a pedophile. I don't know, whatever. So you're like, oh my gosh, I need to think of something to do. And so you're like, oh, I'm gonna implement um, this intervention and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and for sure it'll bring it down or whatever. Um, so it's all of the different components that complete your intervention, um, but sometimes it's hard to know what actually made the change. Um, so that's when you start to learn about a component analysis and how to kind of like break it apart and two basic methods are used for conducting component analysis. So you have your drop out component analysis, 
the investigator presents and assesses the treatment package as a whole, then systematically removes components. So you're going to analyze it. You say, oh yes, these five uh, different procedures that I use uh, decrease the disrobing behavior. But you're like, wait a minute, what actually was it that changed the behavior? So then you start pulling out uh, one thing at a time to kind of figure out um, what made the behavior change. So that's what they're calling a dropout component analysis, where you're systematically removing components. And then you could add in component analysis. The investigator presents and assesses components individually or in combination, then presents the complete treatment package. Okay. And then it says the most effective experimental design use ongoing evaluation of data of individual subjects as the basis for employing the three elements of baseline logic, prediction, verification, and replication. It's really important that you guys know um, the baseline logic prediction, verification, and replication. People who have tested before, have you guys heard a lot of questions about baseline logic? A baseline logic is the backbone for ABA. Yeah, so that one's gonna have um, a lot to it. So um, can I say something about the component? Sure. So the component, um, uh, what my understanding is, you add on, uh, like NCR is not working today. Okay, so I'm going to add FCT in there. And then I'm, I, I don't see it's working, so I'm going to add DRO in there. So this is what's called add-on component analysis. You're, you're one by one systematically add one uh, intervention, then the next, and then next, next, and the next, like that. And then when you see it's working, then you pull it out, and 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 then you see, oh, now you don't need that. You did not need the N NCR. The behavior was decreasing with just the FCT. So then you remove. That's called drop off the mm -hmm. component. So I just wanted to say that to be more clear. Okay. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so then it goes into talking about internal validity, controlling potential sources of confounding in experimental design. Experiments that demonstrate a clear functional relation between the independent variable and target behavior have a high degree of internal validity. So that's a really important one to remember. So if it has a clear functional relation between the independent variable and your behavior, it has a high degree of internal validity. Please, which paragraph is that? Um, I am looking on 248. Okay. And the back of the... Okay, far back to... Yeah, but I feel like we could find it in here. Okay. But that's a good sentence to remember. Isn't there like a nice visual for internal and external validity somewhere? Um, an experimental design strength is determined by the extent to which it demonstrates a reliable effect and B, eliminates or reduces the likelihood that factors other than the independent variable produce the behavior change. 
Although the term experimental control implies that the researcher controls the subject's behavior, the researcher can, own, can control only some aspects of the subject's environment. So that's another big thing about ABA. Um, it's about controlling the environment. We don't necessarily um, have control over their behavior, but we can manipulate the environment in order to change the behavior. So that's okay. always a really important thing to um, kind of remember. Bless you. Okay, where are we in the... Okay, I'm gonna pause it right there so that I can figure out. Okay, um, so Fatima was just telling us about validity and we were talking about um, internal validity and the independent variable is our intervention, everything that we are controlling internally in our experiment that is changing the behavior and it is not the extraneous variables. So we talked about extraneous variables being everything in the environment. So your antecedents, your setting events, um, temperature, lighting, hunger, all of those things that um, we um, can control, I guess. Yes. And then you have your confounding variables, which is stuff that uh, we cannot control. So we find out, um, kind of after the fact, you're like, oops, well, I had no control over that part of the experiment. Um, so stuff like that, those are gonna be your confounding variables. Yeah, I can give you the example if you want for the confounding. Yeah. Uh, you're using m m to teach the, the kiddo, teach the client to um, stay in the seat behavior, but you know you're giving the m m but the grandma was also giving him m m in the morning before he left for the school he did not want to leave so grandma was giving him the m m so basically you you see that he had the double effect of the m m so that was confounded that was not in your control that he already had the m m so now he's satiated he doesn't care to listen to you because he already got it so he had it in the morning, so he doesn't feel anything for the M&M &M today. So that's not in your control. That's confounding. Yeah. He, yeah. He woke up late because he didn't sleep all night. That's not in your hand. Mm -hmm. It was confounding. So those are the confounding that you can't control. Perfect. I love that example. Can anybody else like speak out based on your experience? some type of confounding variable that you were unable to control? Would something like a flickering lights be a confounding variable? Um, yeah, if you didn't, if you didn't intentionally make them flickering lights, I would say so, because um, let's say the the light is the power is going out or something, and that that light is um, been flickering on and off, and he gets overstimulated and upset about it, and you see a spike in the behavior, but it was, that had nothing to do with you. So I would say yes, that's a good one. What about if your child comes to the center or to you? feeling sleepy because he or she is on a kind of medication that is causing him or her to sleep and drowsy. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so as long, like, let's, let's say that that medication was not being given to him throughout your treatment, then yes, it would be a confounding variable. Like, oh, mom just randomly started giving him Benadryl um, to sleep better 
And now I've noticed that in the morning he's groggy or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one too. So if we have high internal validity, we have high, what is it? What we're always trying to prove as the, as a behavior analyst. So control. you have internal validity. So that means you have high control. Yes, experimental control. You have a high functional relation. Okay, and then and then we have external validity. So we want to know, will whatever it is that you are doing in your experiment apply externally to the world or other studies? Um, so who can give me an example of external validity? Would it be like social acceptance of like a socially acceptable behavior? Or? Um, can you elaborate more? Like, oh, like he, you teach him in the clinic and then he's able to do it out in the world or? And I guess like generalization. Yeah. 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 yeah could be it. That's not, that's right. Yeah, so that's a good one. So being able to generalize it out into the world. Anybody else have a good um, example of external validity? I'm trying to make a... So um, I can say something about it if nobody uh -huh. else wants to talk. Yeah, go um, ahead. The external validity is also has to do with repeatability. You are supposed to be able to uh, create the same scenario and get the same result. That's the external validity. You have to be able to um, get the, the result over and over, over and over, and to, to be sure that whatever uh, the in, independent variable made the change in the dependent variable, it's replicable. You can replicate. So that's part of the external validity. And that is what you're talking about generality. That also has to do with the generality, but it has to be doing with the, in the research too, not just the socially different areas, but also research should be, you know, we should be able to do research and get the same result as we did at once, we can do the same thing again and again. So it has to be repeatable with the same recipe. Okay, cool, I like that. So it has to be able to work across individuals as well, right? For it Correct. to have a um, external validity. So let's say you, and apply this intervention and it reduces the behavior in that one person, but then you try it again with um, somebody out, like 10 other people and it doesn't work. It only worked for that one person. Um, so that one would not- Externally really... valid. Nope, it's yeah. not. You're right. Okay. What about social validity? So what does it mean when they say, um, does your experiment um, have social validity? Or let's say I wanna challenge uh, Fatima and I wanna say, um, hey, do you think that you, that experiment is really socially valid for that client? What would, I, what would I mean by that? Or why am I asking her that? That the intervention is socially 
um, acceptable that it's um, it's meeting goals and the outcomes. Socially significant um, to the individual, right? So I think I I I always give this example to the RBTs when I'm uh, training them. It's like, I'm not going to teach you how to hop on one foot and pat your head if, it, if it's not socially valid um, or socially significant for your life. Um, so whenever I think of social validity, I always think about um, going back to that applied aspect. So is it socially significant um, for this individual? Um, is it appropriate for me to teach him this behavior uh, based off of his age or based off of his culture? Um, will he encounter um, these reinforcers naturally in the world? Uh, so that's something that I always uh, want to take into consideration. Um, so one that I always think about is like uh, responding to name, right? You're teaching uh, this child to respond to their name and you're calling him um, Luke. I don't know, let's just say you're calling him Luke. And that's actually his American name, but he's really not Luke. He's something else at home and everybody calls him something else. And I'm over here teaching him how to respond to this other name that nobody ever uses. So it's like, that's not really socially significant to him. He's never going to come in contact to anybody calling him Luke. Um, so why mm -hmm. even teach him? Why don't we teach him how to respond to his other name that his family and culture and everybody else calls him? So that's always something that you want to take into consideration. Um, with your uh, experiments or your interventions. Which is the um, dimension of our ABA, right? It's the, that we want meaningful outcomes and that they have to be appropriate for, like you said, right? Yes. Individual. Perfect. Um, I guess we can pause on that and kind of talk. One, one second. I wanted to add something in this here. Okay. Between social validity and social significance, there is a minor difference. So we can be uh -huh. clear right now. Yeah. Uh, while we're talking, social validity has to do with acceptance in the society that includes the stakeholders, parents teachers, whoever are close to that person. Social significance, uh, um, on the other hand, is the behavior supposed to be important to that particular person. That is a social significant behavior. Does this behavior will help him in the life? For, mm -hmm. for, for example, is, if it has to be age appropriate, if the 20 years old person and uh, you can't teach him to play with the toy you cannot reinforce him that he's playing good you know with a uh, kitchen toy or whatever toy so socially significant and socially valid is a little bit different socially valid has to be society including the stakeholder and everyone else but social significant is particular for that person that yes. person needed it uh -huh. But in order for us to determine um, if we have social validity, uh, it should be assessed in three ways. So you want to determine the social significance of your behavior uh, change goals, the appropriateness, and the social importance. Um, so those things are within uh, determining whether it is socially valid. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great job. Question. Selena, question. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yesterday, I was telling one of my colleagues that we have this uh, preteen boys about 10 or 11 years, 
and he's still using uh, primary reinforcers, food, and those kind of things for as his reinforcer. And I was telling them he's past grown that he should be using things like puzzles, social praise, and other activities instead of still depending on food. So yeah. in that case, is it social significant or social validity? Yeah, so you would be able to question the social validity of her experiments by telling her like, hey, is this really socially significant? Is this really appropriate? Um, is this socially important or socially appropriate? So are his like, are like peers going to be getting reinforced in that way? And all of those things will you'll be able to question the social validity of that experiment you're like wait a minute why um is this happening but you're right and those are always good things to think about um when you're programming and when you're implementing uh something um i've i've actually had experience with that with the older with the older kiddos and it's like you don't need to uh, full physical prompt a 11 year old that's just completely inappropriate he should be able to um, wash his hands by himself so that should be your last uh, resort or never be used for him because he can wash his hands on his own um, hand over hand would not be appropriate in that situation um, so there's a lot of moments where you kind of are questioning um yourself or maybe other people's interventions when you're let's say you're the technician and you have to implement something um, that somebody else put into place and you're like wait a minute this doesn't feel right and so me as a BCBA I always tell my RBTs like if something doesn't feel right don't do it and um, come to me and tell me um, your concerns and then we'll work through it together but I'm always telling them uh, to always question question everything, um, even themselves question me. I don't mind. I love the feedback. I love to learn. And together, we work as a unit to make sure that what we're doing is really um, appropriate for this client. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording. <laughs>